people dress, we tend to look at them and say, okay, that's business professional. It's not business professional. That's too casual. Um, artifacts we're going to take a look at and communicate a lot about us. So uh, visual cues, gestures, appearances, but also vocal qualities, inflection, volume, pitch, and environmental <coughs> factors, the use of space and color. Some professors uh, are just behind a podium and they grip the podium and they never come out behind the podium. Um, what does it communicate when a professor comes out from behind the podium? If, if anything. Okay, confident? Okay, confident, comfortable, class in seven. Prepared. Prepared, they don't, they're not tied to their notes. Okay, yeah, interesting. Uh, we're going to learn that the tone of your voice is a type of nonverbal. Pauses is a type of nonverbal. Uh, I was a theater major, theater communication major at Eastern Michigan University, and Annette Martin was my When you were there as a theater major, you had a performance aspect. You had to perform, and uh, Dr. Annette Martin was one of the best coaches ever. And she did this drill saying your voice is a gesture, and I want to develop it. As much as you develop anything in acting, I want you to develop your voice. So she did this drill. Uh, she gave us a poem. And to this day, I remember the poem. Here's the poem. Death sits at an all-night diner, drinking lukewarm coffee, watching, waiting. And that's the poem. I remember it, because after years of therapy, I can talk about it. Okay, because <laughs> she would do this pause drill. And so you would do it. She said, okay, Tim, take your time. I do not want you to rush this. And so you, you just wouldn't rush it. And so you'd go through, and you'd go, death. Sits at an all night diner drinking lukewarm coffee. Watch it. Wait. And then we go, good. So <laughs> And they're like, death. <laughs> Sits at an all night diner drinking.
So again, it's symbolic. It has to be negotiated between two different people. Um, Nonverbal is rule guided. Handshakes are conventional method of beginning and ending business, right? Uh, a handshake. Um, a high five communicates what? If you saw two business people high five each other, what would that communicate to you? Sorry, that's a huge contract. Yeah, huge contract and a sense of formality with each other. I mean, if Dr. Barry Corey walked in and we gave each other a high five, you would interpret, well, I didn't know they were that familiar with each other. I mean, a handshake would be like, that's the formal way of saying hello. But a high five is really this kind of uh, much more familiar way. So it's similar to verbal in the fact that verbal communication is rule guided, so is nonverbal. Uh, nonverbal communication may be intentional or unintentional. Uh, I do communication consulting, and I remember one of our clients, uh, he would look at his watch at in, in just the worst possible times you could look at your watch. So he'd be talking about starving kids in Africa, saying, you know, those kids are starving right now and they need your help, and I hope all of us would, and I'd go, whoa, wait a minute, Roger, what was that, looking at your watch? And he goes, what do you mean looking at my watch? He said, Roger, look at your watch. And he's like, I, I don't think I do, I have to show him the video tape. To show him, in fact, he looked at the watch. Now, we read into that watch. When a guy's speaking about uh, children starving in another place and he looks at his watch, what does that communicate? What would, what would that communicate that he looked at his watch at that moment? Oh. Yeah. Another place to be, right? What's he have or he's not really there? Yeah, doesn't care. So we kind of have a policy in this class not to text. Now, I, I have kids who text, okay? That's all they do. When I look at you texting, I, I read into that that you're bored, you wish you weren't here. If I were to stop you and say to you, uh, what was your intention in texting, you might say, oh, I'm not bored at all, I just really had to get this off. So I interpret it one way, where you'd say, well, honestly, that was not my intent. So nonverbals can be uh, misinterpreted to a large extent. And let me say this about nonverbals, most of us do not know what our nonverbals are. We're completely unaware of our nonverbals. Um, so when your spouse says to you, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? It's like, what? So you gave me that look. It's like, what? What? Oh, don't tell me what look. You know exactly the look. You know what I mean? <laughs> Most of us are just flat out unaware. How many of you have seen yourself on video today? Is it not horrifying? <laughs> <laughs> I do this. I periodically do this. I bet you every 15 minutes I'll just do it, and I'm good. I'm good for another 15 minutes. <laughs> and I watch myself on videotape, and I said, Noreen, do I do that? Because you do that all the time. And I'm like, wow. Okay? So, it might be unintentional, or your nonverbals might be unintentional. Now let's talk about um, another way that's similar. Nonverbals reflect culture. Nonverbals simply reflect culture. I told you about my time in Africa, um, working in a relief project in Nairobi, and there leaders hold hands as they walk, male leaders. Nothing sexual about it, it communicates respect. So, uh, in Kenya, that's how leaders communicate. Here it might be something totally different. So it does reflect culture, we need to think about the cultural implications of where people get certain uh, parts of their non-verbal. Okay, let's take a look at how uh, Nonverbal is different than verbal communication. Nonverbal is perceived to be more believable. It's perceived to be not uh, more believable. Not necessarily true. Now, based on what I just said a minute ago, why do you think some of the research would show that nonverbal communication may not be more believable than your verbal? based on what I just said about the tongue. Yeah. It might be really unintentional. But I really read into what you're doing. And that's where we get the classic Kennedy-Nixon debate, where they said that Nixon had shifty eyes. And that, that communicated what? When you're watching a person that have shifty eyes, communicate what? Yeah. They're lying, they're not trustworthy. Well, that's all predicated on the fact that that person is intentionally doing it. Uh, Al Gore. Uh, God bless him, was, everybody kept saying he's stiff, 
is wooden and how he communicates, and people said that makes him unapproachable. Uh, I mean, that's a lot to read into what Al Gore is speaking in style. So we have to be careful uh, to think that nonverbals really do communicate what's uh, really true. Second, nonverbal communication is multi channel. Verbally, if we define nonverbal as everything but the words, then we can say that verbal communication is one channel. But if we say that nonverbal has multiple channels, then as I'm speaking to you, think of all the different channels I'm using. One, you look at me and you look at how I'm dressed. You look at my glasses. Are they cool glasses or not? Are they philosopher-type glasses or not? Uh, he has a shaved head. What does that mean? What is that supposed to communicate? How I'm dressed, the fact that I'm walking out right now, uh, the tone of my voice, is he sarcastic, is he sincere, is he harsh? So nonverbal communication is absolutely multi-channel. Uh, by the way, we tell our speakers, we used to tell them, never back up on an audience. So never walk in this far that you have to back up because that communicates weakness. That's kind of old school public speaking. We don't do it much anymore because now, uh, the standard rule is penetrate the audience as much as humanly possible, right? If I'm, if I'm always here, that may communicate power, but it doesn't communicate that I'm relatable. If I step out and move in, it communicates that I'm accessible, I'm relatable. Yeah? So if you were sitting there and you walked out, and going backwards is considered bad, how would you do It's called the triangle. Yeah, great question. It's called the triangle. In old school, public speaking would say that you want to create a triangle. So if you want to speak, you want to come up here, you might come over here, uh, speak over here in a triangle, and then you'd want to come back this way to complete like a triangle. But I would never go backward. Now, I had somebody ask me the question. This goes back to the uh, cultural issue of communication. I said, well, who came up with those rules? What a great question. I honestly didn't know. I said, uh, the people paying me. I have no, I have no idea what to say to that. Well, it comes from our cultural understanding of what's uh, dynamic. And no doubt, it's kind of based on a masculine speaking style. I don't doubt. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it basically comes from our cultural tradition of what communicates authority. And this is kind of what's agreed upon as you take a public speaking class. And you kind of pass on tradition and and hand down wisdom, and what audiences will say, that tends to communicate to me that you're confident. That communicates to me that you're not confident, those kind of things. Uh, and never turn your back to the audience, right? If we have actresses here, never turn your back to the audience, ever, which is now kind of old school. Uh, Nonverbal communication is continuous. One of the most provocative quotes from communication theory is, you cannot not communicate. You cannot not communicate. Now, when we say that, we are not talking about the words themselves or verbal communication, because it can absolutely choose to be quiet. Now, if I'm giving a lecture and I'm making a point and I've been quiet for a long period of time, have I stopped communicating? What would you be thinking if I was quiet for a long period of time? What would you read into that? What's that? This is, yeah, this is just bizarre. I, I, yeah, because you have stuff with the class. Forgot what you're saying. I forgot what I'm saying. Waiting for a response. I'm waiting for a response. You were just talking about the pausing. Yeah, I'm just, yeah. <laughs> I'll just pause like that. Or I can be doing it for dramatic effect. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean, kind of a thing. But, but when we say you cannot not communicate, we are really talking about nonverbal communication, which is just interesting to think about. Because you're always giving a message. When I interviewed at universities on a job search, uh, NC State, uh, Wheaton, they said to me wisely, the people at UNC Chapel Hill, that interview starts the minute you get off the plane. The minute you walk off that plane and walk into the lobby, you're met by somebody, the interview starts. Because they will read into virtually everything that you're doing. Not everything you're saying, because there's times you won't be speaking, but they will look at you. And by the way, on job interviews, that's absolutely true. The times that we have interviewed people, 
uh, at the communication center or even here at Biola, the minute that person steps in, there's no off interview time. You're always being interviewed. People are always assessing you, always, okay? Uh, to make you paranoid, they really can. A key factor, nonverbal, it can augment or totally contradict verbal messages. It can augment or contradict verbal messages. So if I say to Luke, I say Luke, how are you? How would you read into that? Do I care? How are you doing? It's just a cultural that we use it. Yeah. And you might just look at it and say, oh, he does that because he has to. And here at Biola, you really have to, right? Because we're not we're a Christian school. So I'll, I'll be walking by camp, I'll be walking on campus, but having to get somewhere, and I'll pass by someone and they'll say, hey, how are you? And they'll start to answer me. And I'm like, oh, I'm really sorry. <laughs> I don't have any time to answer you. I'm sorry. I think you thought I was Eric Thomas. <laughs> I really got to get. So, if I, but if I said, Luke, how are you? And you go, fine. Like the nonverbals really contradict what the verbal is. Okay? By the way, welcome to Mary. <laughs> how are you? Good. Okay, good. You look pretty good. Okay, that's awesome. uh, Yes, comment, question? Okay. So uh, it can really contradict what we say. The way we say it contradicts our verbal message. So let's ask one question before we get to the various kinds of nonverbal communication. Uh, ladies, it is generally thought, through a gender perspective, that you're experts at reading people. That women really pick up on things that men are like completely oblivious to. I come out and say to Luke, Luke, how are you? And he goes, and Noreen and I will walk away. Well, supposedly, Noreen is hardwired that she would go, wow, what's up with Luke? And I'm like, what do you mean? He said, it's fine. Honey, right? Because we're Neanderthals, right? That's the gender stereotype with men, is we are Neanderthals when it comes to this. So the question has been asked, ladies, are you better at reading people than men? By the way, if you watch the show, uh, Lie to Me. Anybody watch that show, Lie to Me? Uh, based on the true story of a linguistic professor who went off to different cultures and literally categorized and cataloged all the various responses you would have, what communicates fear, what communicates happiness, what communicates deceit, and he literally created a catalog so he became really proficient at reading people to tell what they're really thinking. Yeah? Have you seen on the, uh, the O'Reilly factor, you get to come yeah. to the show? Yeah, I think it's ridiculous. Yeah, uh, there's a, if you watch the O'Reilly factor, there's a woman who her title is nonverbal expert. Uh, and I always say to Noreen, how do you get to be that? I would love to put in an application for that. I would say, if I were on Fox, I'd say, you see, did you see where she raised up the letter opener in a threatening way? That communicated anger. <laughs> okay, that's never happened. No, that, but, but the lie to me individual, I forget his real name, is an expert used by the FBI in order to uh, uh, pick out terrorists and things like that. So there is something to it. I only bring that up to say it's a man who is considered the expert of experts. So ladies, generally speaking, uh, you are to read people more effectively than men. Now, why is that true? Based on two reasons. One, women, and again, these are clues as to why that might actually be true. First, women are socialized to be more attentive to feeling. If anything, the stereotype of men is that we're not attentive to feelings at all, and it's okay to be like that. So from childhood on, most females are encouraged to be sensitive to others and to relationships. Remember what I talked about before? Ladies, you speak your relationships into existence. Men, we tend to do things side by side. So women are caregivers, right? Uh, babysitting. Traditionally, it's a, it's a female that does the babysitting. Uh, women outnumber men in caring professions, social work, nursing, human resources. Predominantly, that is flooded with women whose job is to pick up on cues and be sensitive 
to the needs of others. In my feeling, such a really good at reading people because you've been socialized to be expert. Second reason. Women's decoding skills result from their standpoint as subordinate members of society. So ladies, traditionally, you're in a subordinate role. You're the secretary to the boss. So the boss can go out throughout life and not care anything what the secretary thinks. He doesn't care. She is there to do what I want her to do. He doesn't need to know if she's having a bad day. That is irrelevant to him because he simply gives her an order and he doesn't care if she's in a good mood or not. The secretary, though, has to be aware of the boss's mood. Why? She could get fired if she's not. So I don't know if you've ever had uh, professors or bosses, but I remember having a boss once where you would walk up to the secretary and say, hey, what kind of mood is he in right now? She'd go, not a great one. I'd come back tomorrow. OK? Because, ladies, traditionally you're in subordinate roles, uh, you have to become proficient at interpreting other people. This kind of comes from uh, Hegel's uh, master-slave distinction. A master does not need to know anything about the slave's lives. Uh, but a slave really has to know what the master is thinking at all times, or it isn't safe for that individual. Uh, three nonverbal behaviors are especially important in exerting power. Vocal qualities, touch, and use of space is how we traditionally exhibit power within the United States. So Barry Corey, if I come across campus and there's Barry Corey, uh, I do not have the freedom to walk up to Barry Corey and give him a fist pump. Or put my arm around Barry Corey. Why? He's the president. Now, Barry Corey can walk up to me and go, Mio, Mark, great job. You know what I mean? Kind of a thing. He can initiate that. Why? Because he's the president. But uh, there's a power differential that tends to happen that we have to watch in the use of touch. Tone. My goodness, what's a big part of parenting? Hey, let's not talk to mom that way. Hey, that tone of voice will get you in trouble, young man. Got it? Because I have the power as the dad to say I can monitor your tone. Then space is huge. When I first got to Viola, my office, we actually, it's the old president's house that's been torn down since I've gotten here, uh, was my office. And I had the master bedroom. It was huge. So Eric Tonis and Dave Talley were helping me move in, and they walked in my office, and it was huge. And they were like, no way. God, how do you get an office like this? Space really does communicate to us power. We expect the president's office to be the biggest and the most elaborate. And if we were to walk in there and it was a really small office, we'd be like, nice. He's the president. Why doesn't he have a bigger office? Okay. Uh, men tend to use greater volume and stronger inflection when it comes to something like vocal quality. So, let's talk about forms of nonverbal communication. Artifacts are personal objects that influence how we see ourselves and express the identity we create for ourselves. One huge way we do that is through artifacts. So I am looking for Casey. Casey, I, I can help but notice <coughs> that you have a piece of metal attached to your nose. Okay. Now, what does that, and it looks great, yes. <laughs> but what does that communicate? What, what do you want it to communicate? Oh, artifacts really are important. I mean, um, when Noreen and I went uh, looking at glasses, I put on a certain pair of glasses, and they're like, no, oh, no, 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 no. The watch goes, ah, I don't even know why, but you know, that's just, and then, you know, you put on another one, she goes, oh, that's so cool, but I don't think you should do that. Why? <laughs> <laughs> she goes, ah, ah, It's like, oh, okay. So, you know, that kind of a stuff. Um, so, let's, let's talk about gender implications, though. This gets really interesting, okay? Stuff, uh, <laughs> 
gender theorists have said a couple of interesting things about what we consider to be business professionals. Okay, so take a look at the men's outfit, and here are a couple of observations gender theorists would make. One, it is stylish but practical. It um, deep pockets that you can put stuff in. Uh, I mean, ton of pockets. Think about it. Here, here, on the side here, on the side of his coat, on the inside of his coat, and on the inside of the coat, he has pockets. And even a shirt. Yeah, excellent. Oh, yeah, yeah, right here as well. Okay? So, it's stylish, but it's also meant to be practical. Now, ladies, uh, she may have pockets there, but they're not functional pockets. You can't really put anything there. And she has no pockets on her skirt. So Noreen's always saying to me, look, can you hold this? Can you take this? Can you hold this? Or she has a purse that has everything in it. We could be trapped and stranded for a week. <laughs> okay. So um, some have said, and by the way, you know that most designers today are men, designing women. So it is to be attractive business, but not practical. Okay? Uh, this is another one, interesting one to think about. Mm. Shoes. Men's dress shoes are very practical. I, I mean, you could run in your dress shoes. And if you don't believe that, watch any homicide TV show. <laughs> <laughs> You've got, you know, man is detectives just hauling after somebody. But take a look at these. So. <laughs> So look at these. How practical are these? I look at Noreen sometimes. I'm like, how do you do that? How can you walk in those? What's that? And you have to put like band-aids on where you get blisters. Okay, they hurt. They're not stable. Yeah. And what are they designed to do? Make your legs look hot. But to raise your calf muscles up so that to be attractive for men. Now, just to show how, yeah. Oh, no. Something came up about this, and there's this, my mom and I were talking about it, and there's a saying, not like an official saying, but there's some saying that goes like, women can do anything men can do in heels, or something, or oh. something like that. Something yeah, in heels. heels. Yeah. I came across, I was watching, I forget what I was watching. Oh, I know what it was. Regis and. <laughs> and they were giving away um, prizes to women who could, uh, bridal prizes, if whoever could complete a sprint in heel. <laughs> now, what's crazy about that? Women were wiping out like crazy. Like <laughs> crazy. Because it's a full sprint. So I forget how much money for the bridal shower or whatever. Just to show you, the joke is, hey, these are things are so impractical. Let's have a sprint. A mile in her shoes. Guys, can you imagine? Oh my God. Do you have heels on right now? Yes. <laughs> what size are you? Oh. Oh. But that's crazy. Okay, so interesting. Artifacts are gender driven in many different ways. A different form of nonverbal is proxemics, refers to space and our use of it. Space is a primary means by which a culture de designates who is important and who has privilege. So I want you to think about this point. I talked about a very famous essay by Virginia Woolf. Let me ask you this question. Go back to your home of origin and think, did dad have a special place in that home? OK, Michelle, you're shaking your head yes. What was your dad's place? Well, right now it's a couch right in front of the TV upstairs. And before it's been a chair, but he has like a chair. Okay. He has his chair. Mm -hmm. Guys, my dad had a chair. And, and no one got in the chair. <laughs> when, when I brought my kids to go visit Grandpa, and they would climb in the chair, Grandpa, oh no, any other chair with that chair. 
Anybody? Their dad had a, oh yeah, go ahead. No, actually, that was my spot. Okay, so mom has a spot. Yeah. How many of you dad sat at the head of the table? Okay, yeah, for sure, my dad. How many of you, your dad had a, 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 a woodworking place or a workshop? Okay. How many of you, your dad had a den in his office? The holy of holy. Okay. Now, think back to your mom for a second. Did mom have a den? How many of you, your mom had an office space, a den? Well, she could go to. My mom's got a. My dad built out in our backyard. It used to be like where we had a spot. And he built a whole like craft room. Awesome. And then when I moved out, <laughs> and, then, and then when I moved out, she literally took everything out of my room. Okay. Out of her craft center. Now you've been banished. Yeah, basically. I was on the couch. <laughs> Anybody else? Mom had a place. Did mom have a, a workstation that she could do woodworking or? <laughs> the kitchen. Oh. No, think about that. Think about that. That is Virginia Woolf's point in an essay called A Room of Her Own, where she does argue that men often have places to go to be creative, to be thoughtful, to get away from it all. Mom had a place, and it was either the kitchen or the laundry room. So mom's place was functional and served other people. Dad's place could be a place that he went to get away, an office and things like that. She argues that the creativity of women has been stifled because we do not think it is important to give the woman a place to go just to be there and waste time and not always have to be uh, productive. Interesting thought, isn't it? Uh, that we don't tend to look at mom or the woman of the home and say, you need a place where you can let your creative juices flow. Yeah. Would a garden count? No, a garden would count. Because my mom okay. always has like, her section of the garden. Yeah, I think a garden would count. Uh, although, I, I think we want to say, but it's not part of the home proper, which is interesting. But Dad might have the garage where he set up his workshop as well. No, I think a garden is important. Yeah. Other gender theorists have argued that the, even gardening became this uh, anti-cultural moment, almost, where women weren't allowed to be creative, really, in many places in culture. And the garden was a place where she could release her creativity and grow flowers and have a place. Yeah. So I think there is truth in that. Yeah. Well, what if she does like to create things? So would that be her creative spot in the kitchen? Yes. Yeah. It, it would be. And now, now, isn't it interesting that men are co-opting that space? And if you take a look today, all the shows about cooks and stuff like that, uh, it tends to be men dominating that, which is an interesting cultural message. But the only thing I think that could be said about that is that um, a woman may have been regulated to it and love it. It's kind of like it's kind of you said to me, Tim, you must go and have a um, a woodworking place or the garage where you could work with car. Now I might go there and actually find out, hey, I actually kind of like this, but I kind of was regulated to it and said, this is what you are to do as a man. Is that kind of yeah. Or even for someone that, like my mom. Yeah, and again, there are creative ways that women can adapt to this. Um, and again, remember, there's exceptions to every observation we're making, because there's a lot of guys who like to do home decorating as well, and are very creative with that as well. So yeah, great point. Uh, let's take a look at another one. Haptics, uh, which means touch. The first of our senses. To develop, touch is an important form of nonverbal behavior. So, how rough is too rough? Oh, I'm sorry. The first of our senses to develop, touch is an important form of nonverbal behavior.
Pasta Bear. <laughs> yeah, the rest of them just said, uh, Dad, you can pin all of us in 10 ridiculous, like 10 minutes. You could pin all of us in 10 minutes. I said, I can pin all of you in under a minute. I pin all of you in 50 seconds. No way. There's no way you can do that. I set the microwave in 50 seconds. And 49 seconds later, two of the kids were crying. <laughs> all of them were pinned, and Ari looked at me and said, Really? <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> Jason is now almost 6'2. Six 6'2. Two. Six two. And Michael's taller than me. And Jeremy, I can still control. But now, I don't know if I could. I knew it would be. I'd have to hurt those kids. Because <laughs> I'm not beyond doing it. <laughs> oh my goodness. Jason and I wrestled the other day. He is strong. Oh, my goodness. So, how's Ruffle? Uh, when my kids were really young, I used to love to take them to Annie Jones Park in North Carolina. And I used to love to go there when there was a man there with a daughter and a son. It was my favorite <coughs> gender observation. And the daughter would be running in a dress in a sand pit and fall in a sand pit. And the dad would jump up, grab her, brush away the sand, and say, Princess, are you okay? The son would be swinging in a swing let go of the swing and hit a brick building. <laughs> Crumple to the ground. And what would the dad say? Get up. You're fine. You're fine. I mean, my dad, he's being cut. My dad, I mean, being cut, he's going to put, um, mature, mature cone, what do you call that? There's this antibacterial thing, but it's stung a lot of years. And so I had this cut, and he says, okay, look for it. So I'm like, Dad! He goes, no, I can over it. Dad! He goes, I'll blow on it. I'll blow on it to make it better. Okay, pours it. I'm like, you're not blowing! <laughs> He's like, oh! <laughs> oh, my goodness. How many of you ladies, uh, your dad played rough with you? Wrestled with you, kind of threw you around. Really? Sort of a kind of one. A few times I would want to be included, like with my brother. Right. So, but he, I, he would probably, obviously, be way more gentle with me. I wouldn't notice, but I would still think I was in it. Kind of. Just to like, no, well, just to kind of like see, would be like, oh, like, um, like push, push into me as hard as you can, like just to see if like right. how strong I was. Or right. So there's that. Was, you know, yeah. I used to say to my kid, hit me as hard as you can. No, go ahead. I think you do the old joke with your kids you have to do once in your life. This is why you have kids. This is why you have kids. You say to your son, all right, we're going to have a competition. See so who can hit the softest. Who can hit the softest. Okay? And I say, okay, hit me. And my son would go. My son would go. Right, good. Now go. Lose. <laughs> That's why you have kids. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Um, no, when, when, by the way, birthdays in my house, when you woke up in my house and it was your birthday, the first words out of your mouth were like, <laughs> why? Why would you say that in my house? With two older brothers in the factory work with the dad, what's going to happen during that day? You're going to get tackled and spanked as hard as humanly possible, whatever age you are. <laughs> I tried to start that in my house. I tried, and Noreen was like, no, no, you will not do that. I was like, that's kind of a, no. Mom, can we talk about this? No. Pray about it? No. Forms of nonverbal. Kinesis refers to face and body movement. Right? What's lady like? <laughs> Not that. <laughs> See, guys, ladies, you need to know how a fight starts between men. A fight starts, right, guys? Eye to eye, not backing away at all. Not backing away at all. And um, a fight will start if you touch each other. 
right? That signifies a fight. You can look at each other all day long and stare down at each other, but if your head is touched, if any part of you touches, that's a fight. It's, it's game on. That's how a fight starts. And I've had many stare downs with guys in high school and stuff like that. Uh, my favorite story about gender, I have two older brothers, and one day I was in, um, this must have been, elementary school, oh, junior high, I think it was junior high, and the window was open and the guy pops his head in and he looks right at me, points right at me and says, after school we're going to beat the crap out of Two guys from high school. And I was like, I, I didn't know now. Teacher walks up to me, she can see that I'm outside. And she said, would you like to, you want to go call your parents? You want to do anything? I said, yeah, can I make a quick phone call? So I go to the office and I say, mom, I call my mom, mom, Tell Bob and Ken to meet me at Green Generators. Okay, Green <laughs> Generators. She's like, is everything okay? Mom, Green <laughs> Generators. She goes, okay, Green Generators, fine. So I walk out of school. Here are these two high school kids, and they grab me. So we're gonna beat the crap out of you. And I'm like, okay, left, we gotta go to the Green Generators. Fight. They're like, okay, fine. <laughs> so we turn, by the way, I was not a Christian at the time. Okay? And I said the most sincere prayer I've ever said in my life to this day. I said, Bob, Ken, and I'll walk, Bob, Ken. <laughs> Bob would play, uh, he had a, a record for most tackles at my high school that lasted almost 15 years and played one year of college football. Ken was just mean. <laughs> <laughs> he was mean and a little unstable. Okay? So they walked, and by the way, my body position, right? It just changed. They walked out, I was like, I got <laughs> then Ken did something. It took years to work through this. He walks up to me and goes, Give me your glasses. I was like, What? He goes, Give me your glasses. I go, What? He goes, You're going to beat him up first. When you're done with him, you're going to beat him up. I was like, Can we talk about this? <laughs> he, goes, oh, he goes, Walk right up to him. And hit him. Don't say a word. Walk right up to him. And I was like, Took my glass off, walked right up to his kid. He said, Okay, you're going to be coming. <laughs> And the other kid stepped forward, my two brothers were like, like that. So he picked his friend up and carried him away. And I turned to my brother Ken, I was like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> and I put my glass on his right? But you know what? Went home, talk about gender moment. Went home, they told my dad, what do you think my dad said? Good, job. Good for you. Think of the powerful cultural moment. Right? You handled yourself. Like a man. Think of all the work that's of that, okay? Now, today, we don't do that. Today, talk it out. Right, Nico? And this is a PhD panel, okay? Talk it through. Okay? Yeah. Um, my little Yeah. And girls aren't supposed to resolve things that way. By the way, I, I have a picture of MMA. Women do MMA. And, and some of them, the cyborg who beat Gina, I forget what's her name, she was on. Uh, Oh, yeah, American Gladiator. And, and Gina is, is this contradiction in MMA because on one hand she's a model, a professional model, and she's an MMA fighter. And the woman who beat her, called the Cyborg, she's not getting any modeling contracts. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, not, not, in, not in the sense that Gina's getting those kind of you know, contracts. So she beat the tar. Anybody see that fight? She beat the tar out of Gina. Beat the car out of her. Yes. Wasn't it like last week where all these girls yeah. were beating each other? Well, what came out was fight clubs for girls. And it was horrifying. Right? Fight clubs for men, teenage boys, is terrifying. But a fight club for teenage girls was terrifying. Because that's what not what women do. It's just kind of crazy. Okay? To think that way. Yeah. Yeah. I remember Michael's first experience with Top Warner football. Uh, the middle linebacker for the other team girl, and she had a ponytail coming out the pump, pump under her helmet, and Michael was just kind of chuckling about it and all this kind of stuff. It was a scrimmage, and that girl was unbelievable. I mean, talk about lighting people up. She was unbelievable, and uh, earned Michael's respect pretty quickly. By the way, uh, refers to face and body movements. Uh, it just happened, it was in the news, uh, a boy in Iowa wrestling, in Iowa wrestling was paramount. He was picked to win the uh, state championship in his weight class, but his first round match was against a girl, and he forfeited. Forfeited the match, would not wrestle the girl, so it was unladen. 
it, was, it would not be right for him to treat a woman that way. Okay, and forfeited, went into the loser's bracket and didn't come out of the loser's bracket. And some people said he gave up his chance to win the state on principle. By the way, he was a Christian. He said he was a Christian, and, and for biblical reasons, he would not run Which was interesting. Not to say we agree with that, but that was his rationale, is that it just was not proper for a man to wrestle. Uh, forms of nonverbal uh, physical characteristics refer to aspects of personal appearance which are elevated according to cultural standards. Our appearance itself is less the issue than how well it fits or fails to fit with cultural ideas. So, it refers to aspects of personal appearance, which are evaluated according to cultural standards. Our appearance itself is less the issue than how well it fits or fails to fit with cultural ideas. Yeah. Um, yes? Does that necessarily mean? Uh, ESPN does these great documentaries called 30 for 30. They're really well done. And they were doing one in the Fab Five. Uh, first time in NCAA basketball history five freshmen started for a team. And they were the Fab Five. Chris Weber, Jalen Rose. Uh, something Jackson. Yeah, something Jackson. King. Yeah, King, awesome. King. Uh, first time ever. Well, these kids uh, went up to their coach and said, okay, we're not wearing the short first. I mean, go back, go back to the mid, late 80s and watch what men were wearing. And we look at it now and be horrified. But back then, short basketball shorts were it. They were the style. And the Fat Five literally went up to their coach and said, we're not doing it. We're not wearing the short shorts. We want to wear the baggy shorts. And we're wearing black socks and black shoes. And the coach, Steve Fisher, said, OK, if you win games for me, I don't care how you dress. So they came out, and it was a fashion revolution. People were laughing, literally laughing at the uh, Fat Five for wearing black socks. And I said to my kids, boys, Seriously, black socks? I said, you didn't know I'm from the generation that if I was hit by a car wearing tennis shoes and black socks, I would live long enough to take the black socks off. <laughs> hey, no one died. And they just look at me like that. You're so old school. So that's kind of what it is. But we're not talking about fashion when it comes to physical characteristics. We're talking about your actual body, whether it fits in or not. So ladies, obviously this applies to men, Obviously, it applies to men. Okay, you see those, you see those commercials. Men, we walk by the men how magazines where a man's abdomen spells mom. You know, it's like <laughs> small objects are rotating around his biceps, and you're like, wow, wow, that's un that is unbelievable. Right? And, and who's the who's the crazy guy from the Jersey Shore? What's his name? Situation. Situation. Yeah. And he just holds his shirt up. That's his whole thing. And I'm like, okay. So men, we deal with that a little bit, okay? Yeah, comment. Oh, well, I was just gonna say, like back in the day, it, it was attractive for women to be like pale and like oh. plump, and then today it's like tan and really skinny. So yeah, yeah. And I just made, yeah, and I just made the comment that. Um, <laughs> Women are dieting, studies have shown that women are dieting as young as elementary school now. That girls are dieting. Why? Uh, the answer to that partially is they see their mom doing it. Moms are on perpetual diets, and they tend to think this is what it means to be feminine, is to be on a diet. Yeah? How does that relate to, you know, a lot of girls are dieting at that age, but there's a big problem with child Well, child, yeah, and, and there, it's hard to answer that question, to be honest. It's not to say that all girls in elementary school are dieting. That's that just clearly the case. But, but to have increasing reports of girls dieting in, in elementary school is, I think, what's concerning. Probably, if it, it'd be interesting to see what's a bigger issue, obesity or girls having this image. Um, another study was done of women professionals saying uh, and again, these are anonymous surveys saying 
Is it more important for you to get promoted in your job or lose 10 pounds? And how close it was to being equal. Right? So that's why I took that picture. Now listen, there's absolutely nothing wrong with getting in shape. And all of us need to get in shape. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But to have her happiness be based on her weight is a problem. And that is concerning. And we have to fight against that idea that my self-image is linked to my physical body. Remember I showed you that this is a slippery target. Remember I showed you what pinups would look like on the side of World War II bombers, Marilyn Monroe, today would be an overweight model. And then I showed you what Bathsheba looked like, Rembrandt's version of Bathsheba, in which she was very, uh, we'd say, heavy. Okay, so it's a moving target right now. And things like the Dove campaign for Rube Beauty is trying to call into question, really ladies, the most important thing about you is your physical being? And I think as a Christian institution, we need to be very careful not to send out that message. And I think sometimes men send that out indirectly because the attractive girls, whatever we mean by attractive, at this moment in culture, tend to be the ones who get asked out. And, and girls who don't necessarily fit that uh, tend not to get out asked as much. Because men are, and there's nothing wrong with being attracted to a person. But the thing you have to remember is God does not look at the outward qualities. He looks at your heart, whether it's a sacrifice. He, he looks at qualities, um, the beatitude, blessed are the peacemakers. And when it comes to marriage, now, I'm married to a beautiful woman, okay? She is just beautiful. Uh, but you really realize in marriage, we've been married 20 years now, the beauty thing fluctuates, okay? And it's not the most important thing. If you, had, if you were married to a really attractive person, and each year that you were married, they got a little bit more cranky, or life just overwhelmed them, uh, but they were attractive, you, you would trade that in a heartbeat for a person who was following God, stable, growing in maturity. Some people are like, there's a cat in maturity. I play basketball with guys on a weekly basis that honestly I feel like I jump back into high school every time I play. The things they're still talking about, right? The things they're still talking about, the things they're, they consider um, attractive about women, married, and commenting on the women walking through the community center. And it's like, really? We're back in high school? I mean, all these stupid jokes you did in high school, right? Certain words, and you know what I mean? Crazy. So you want to marry a person that is maturing, and, and you would trade physical beauty in a heartbeat when you're doing the day-to-day -day life of 20 years with a person. Remember that proverb that says, I'd rather be up on the roof than with a spouse who is cranky, okay? So, uh, I, so I, I, I put this here because I thought that was semi-humor. It would be interesting to see how women starve themselves, not eating healthy, but starving themselves, and then, uh, the fact that she's, um, yeah, happy because I, I got the weight I wanted. Okay? That's kind of disconcerting. So, any questions about nonverbal? I know we kind of hit it very quickly, and again, you can do a PhD in nonverbal communication, and it's that deep. But, any thoughts, questions about gender and nonverbal? And we didn't even talk about how to sit ladylike during an interview. Right? And how men are supposed to sit during an interview. And, and of course, men, now ladies, I understand you have it wrong, but men have a litmus test of masculinity. Right? And here's the litmus test. Right? Luke? Right? Right? This is the litmus test. Oh, see, we got a bad grip. See, and you're immediately going, oh, nuts! Nuts! All right, let's do it again. Yeah! Okay. Right? You're just, this is, how would you like to live your life that way? Your masculine, my dad was a factory worker, so it needed to be up. And he didn't even like girls. No. And, and again, girls, it's kind of creepy every once in a while. Yeah, it's just creepy. You shake their hand and it's like, whoa, yikes, what was that? It's like a nothing, you know what I mean? Yeah? But that's important when you're going out for an interview is to have to kind of handshake too. Yes, but ladies, you're under a weird kind of standard. Because I think some men, male bosses would want a firm handshake, but it cannot be too firm because then you're proving something. I mean, if I shake your hand and you really give me a hard one, it's like, okay, what's up with you? Like, what are you trying to prove there? So you're kind of like in this weird thing of like, how much is too much and what's it? You know what I mean? 
big time. Okay? So any questions? Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.